Organized labor has expressed concern over Nigeria's quote-unquote rising debt profile. President of the Trade Union Congress of Nigeria, TUC, Comrade Festa Zosifo, who raised the alarm in a communique read at the end of its National Executive Council, NEC, meeting on Tuesday in Abuja. He noted that the amount of money required to keep servicing Nigeria's debt was growing on a daily basis. Osifo who urged the federal government to look into the nation's debt profile as soon as possible, stated that 2024 budget presented by President Bola Tinumbu has an aggregate expenditure estimated at 27.5 trillion, and that details of the budget showed that the government budgeted 8.25 trillion naira. 30% for debt servicing in 2022. According to the Debt Management Office, DMO, Nigeria's total debt profile, Nigeria's total public debt rose to 87.38 trillion in the second quarter of 2023, recording an increase of 75.29%. Joining us to look at this, is the president of the Association of Small Business Owners in Nigeria, Asbon, Dr. Femi Egbeshola. Doctor, good to have you on Plus Politics. Hello, Dr. Egbeshola. Yes, I can hear you. Good evening. Good evening. And thank you for having me. Pleasure is all ours. We really want to thank you. Doctor, how does it feel to be an entrepreneur, uh, a value innovator in, in a microeconomic environment where debt does not only choke the public expenditure, but indeed is creating unbearable factors such as high interest rate, such as inflationary, hyperinflationary trend for people like you. How does it feel? Well, it is unfortunate and it is the worst of times for those of us who are in the micro, small and medium business sector. It's been very, very tough, particularly for this past uh, one or two years. We have been uh, visited with avalanche of challenges reading from those that you have mentioned and beyond that. And um, to show that it has been very difficult, data has shown that about 20 to 25% of businesses have closed shop. And the bigger businesses also, you can see that um, report shows that they are relocating from Nigeria in droves. Quite a lot of conglomerates, multinationals are leaving the shores of the country to other climes where they feel that ease of business will and enable them to do better in making their business more viable and be able to stabilize their business. It's been that bad. And um, we've been thinking that uh, there will be hope along the line, but as we speak, the, the hope is elusive. We are confused. The uh, sector is in their dilemma. Of course, you remember that we are the one that employs 86% of all the job, jobs in the country, and we create 94% of uh, the businesses in the country. So if the sector is impacted negatively, it should be a concern for everybody, particularly governments, because um, we are the engine room of growth, and nothing ought to stamper or hamper our successes in business. But the reverse is the case now. We are not breathing. We need to breathe. Government needs to help us always. And one of the ways is what we are talking about today, uh, having a budget that is more of borrowing than, than revenue. If you look at the budget, you will discover that the debt servicing uh, amount is almost at par with the revenue that the country is going to generate for the period of the year 2024. That's not a development project or uh, budget. And it means that... Uh, there's much ado, a lot needs to be looked at. We need to begin to talk about how to reduce our debt profile and begin to generate more revenue and grow our economy. And it is good that we're talking about it this night. Dr. Dr. Beshola, I wonder at your, 
at your next meetings and when you have your plenary. Um, I, I wonder what your members tell you about the cost of power. I, I'm just thinking as a Nigerian now, maybe because I'm an entrepreneur too, that in the last one calendar year, your cost of power generation, running basic lightings in your offices, I'm not even talking about those who run machinery and equipment, just basic lighting in your offices and making sure that you don't get choked by heat, running your air conditioning system, uh, especially in an environment where power is epileptic and you have to run uh, generators and a liter of diesel now is about is averaging 1,250 to 1,300. Just give us your experience. Just tell Nigerians, maybe those who are in government can, can listen, get to hear and listen what it takes to be a micro, medium entrepreneur in today's Nigeria. I'm so happy that uh, you are feeling our pains and you have spoken so well and rightly. That is our lot this time. Uh, when fuel subsidy was removed, we were expecting that before government would go that far, some form of alternative would have been provided. One of such alternative is a stable power supply. We would have expected that power would have improved. But unfortunately, power did not improve. Rather, the, the, the megawatts being generated dropped from over 6,000 megawatts to, over four, to less than 4,000. And that has been challenging. It's, it's very, very tough for us. We spend so much on power generation and accessing power. It's been epileptic. We are funding our own power projects, our own power supply, our own power generation, all by ourselves. And of course, you know that we have limited resources in our, in our disposal. So for us to be able to power this and power that, it's a lot and it's, it's telling on our profits. And that's why you have quite a number of um, uh, prices is going up every day because we have to pass the bill to the consumers. For example, if you take me as an instance, I run a business whereby I spend about 250,000 naira daily on diesel. Every day I spend an average of 250,000 naira. You can imagine by saying that kind of naira to just yes, to power your, fa to, to power to your factory to line? To power by generator, yes. You can imagine if I can save that in 30 days. I may not need to go to any bank for loans because uh, that would have been good enough to cater for other expenses that I need to run. Doc and doctor, also improve my business. Doctor, I, I, I need to quickly put this in in view of the last point you just made. When the president removed subsidy, whether planned or unplanned, the first line of communications we were getting from from his media and last was that uh, we will be doing energy transition, that we will, the, the, we will be transiting to using, say, CNG, which is far cheaper. And I'm sitting here now talking to you, it just, it just dawned on me that, you know what, if anybody should tell us if government is serious enough about the energy transition opportunity, that presents itself behind the, the lacerating challenges we have now, it should be you, because you are the leader of the businesses that ought to revolutionize our energy distance properly and shook by the government. I hope I'm making a point. Are you in any way, shape, or form getting feelers from your members that the government is putting out their articulate policies to engage with your members, say, in energy sector at the micro level, in training of this manpower that will be needed for the transition, in, in, uh, in enterprise investment, in conversion, say, generator conversion, vehicular conversion. Are you getting that feedback as the leader of people who should be the army of the revolution? Um, at the moment, we are not. And it is not too good for us. We have been clamoring over time that for us to get it right as a country, 
We need to work together. We need to collaborate together. We have been advocating that government needs to collaborate and with various st stakeholders, critical stakeholders in every sector. For example, in our sector, we expect that for policies to be made that will affect us directly, we should be part of the making of the policy. We are the one that wears the shoes. We know where it pinches the most. And we expect that the government should always engage us when policies that relate to us are to be made. That will help us to co-create the policy. It will help us to hold the policy. It will help us to give our own sort of advice and suggestions to government. And when those policies are being passed out at the end of the exercise, who will be part of those who will implement, evaluate, monitor, and see that the policy is a success. But unfortunately, as we speak, that has not been made possible. We hope that in future time, government will see need to collaborate more with us. We are the one that leads these people, those in the micro, small, and medium sector. They listen to us the more. The people, the business owners at the point in time, have become disenfranchised people from, with government. They do not have confidence in whatever government says again. They believe in the leaders of these business membership organizations. And when we tell them this is what we need to do, they listen to us more than government. And that's why we even tell them, for you to generate taxes, you need to work with us. Okay, uh, you, you have, you, you know, the, 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 very, the very interesting part of interviewing you this evening, doctor, is that I guess as a result of the fact that you are not only a doctor of theory, but a doctor of practice when it comes to entrepreneurialism, you are actually the one giving me the feeder to chase your, to, you. to chase your intellection. You have just spoken to another, another challenge that, you know, that, seems to be to be choking businesses or emasculating businesses in our ecosystem and that is multiple taxation uh, somebody like you i guess who is in, in manufacturing before vehicles move from your from your yard to the market one area boy somewhere will stop your drivers want to take one money uh, they, they want to enter the market one toffee or one, uh, one power this thing will take his own money. These are all taxes to the business that are not going to the public purse. And I'm thinking, why has God been so gracious that you are even still looking this handsome with all those challenges? Well, I would say it is the grace of God. When it comes to taxes, that's another big topic that... Um, we cannot exhaust. Uh, it will shock you to know that uh, some of the vehicles, some of these trucks moving on the roads have over 100 different tax papers, different papers, over 100 of them. 100, as in 100. Zero, zero. Yes, over 100. You begin to count 1, 2, 3, 4, and you count over 100 different papers in forms of taxes and levies. And you begin to wonder where... Very, very absurd. And then um, we are happy that um, the current government of the day has put up a committee on tax and fiscal reforms. We hope that um, at the end of the day, this committee will be able to uh, come out with a wonderful report. We had some, the first phase of the report. And I must tell you that we're able to make some contributions in form of white paper to the committee, hoping that to be part of the final recommendation that will be made to government. And uh, and adaptation. We hope that the government will be able to implement and adapt those recommendations that will be made. We have been clamoring for unified, harmonized taxes. The people are ready to pay taxes, but when you begin to see the kind of taxes coming to you every day and the way and manner they come, it makes you, it makes you become averse to taxes. It makes you not want to pay taxes. More so, when you see the affluence of political leaders compared to uh, the kind of infrastructure, the decay of infrastructure we have in the country, you become averse to taxes. We want to pay taxes. We want to government to even expand their tax net because we really want to pay taxes. But what about paying taxes more to even the non-state actors 
who are littering the road. From every kilometer you go, you meet these sick actors on the road demanding for this and that. Some of these sick actors will mount their roadblock beside the police, uh, police roadblock, and the police will look away and nothing happens. You begin to wonder what really is happening. Is, this, is the government actually promoting ease of doing business or ease of killing business? Uh, it, 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 that's why I use the word avalanche of challenges. It's just too much on us. We are just surviving by the grace of God. And that's why the data showing the number of businesses that are closing by the day is alarming. I told you the other time that the data showed about 20 to 25 percent of businesses have closed up. According to data, we have about 40 million businesses at the moment. So when we are talking of 2025, we are talking of about, about 10 million businesses folding up. 10 million businesses is alarming. It's, it gives everybody shivers. It's a cause for concern. And we should all be interested in remedy. Doctor, they abandon their businesses and embrace Jackman syndrome. They are leaving the country in droves to do many jobs abroad. It's affecting the branding of our country. It's affecting our image. It's discouraging the young ones from embracing entrepreneurship, and it is not good for us because if we don't develop this sector, how are we going to engage these seeming graduates that need jobs tomorrow? How are we going to engage them? How are we going to grow our economy? How will our tax grow also? How will our revenue grow if we are not growing this sector? I am happy that we are bringing this up now. And uh, I believe that uh, if all of us put our hands on deck, keep talking about this, maybe one day, just one day, Government will hear about it and see need to do something. Something just must be done. Doctor Femi Egbeshola, we really, really, really have to thank people like you for resilience, for tenacity, for value innovation, for entrepreneurial creativity. And I must say, that I heartily, heartily pray that people like you will beat the odds and enjoy the beneficence of the, of the invisible but very, very rugged wall that you are putting up to survive as businesses in, in Nigeria. Wish you all the best, sir. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. But it goes beyond prayer. Thank you so very much. Thank you.